Hey guys, welcome to another video in this lecture series. Today we're going to talk about the differences between Charcot and osteomyelitis on MRI. This is a very common question that comes up on board exams and your interviews, and also something you're going to see clinically. So let's get started. The first thing you want to understand are the limitations. Before ordering any exam, you always want to know the limitation of that exam. And I'm going to divide this lecture into two parts. I'm going to go into bone and soft tissue for both. So in terms of limitations on the osteous portion, bone marrow edema is going to be the first sign of both osteomyelitis and Charcot. However, bone marrow edema is also seen in several other conditions, such as surgery. If you take a post-op MRI, you'll see bone marrow edema. Also where you see fracture, so post-traumatic. IA, meaning inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid, you're going to see bone marrow edema, and also with osseous tumors. In terms of soft tissue, again, you will see soft tissue edema and inflammation in both Charcot and osteomyelitis, but you can also see the same when you have cellulitis or fibrovascular scar tissue. So just understand that it's the same findings that you see in the Charcot and osteomyelitis, are also seen in other pathologies and other conditions. But specifically for this lecture, we're going to focus on Charcot and osteomyelitis. Now in terms of osseous, bone marrow edema, what's the big difference? When you consider osteomyelitis, the general concept you want to have is really an erosive process where it eats away at bone. Whereas Charcot arthropathy is really a joint destructive procedure or a process, as you say. So the marrow edema in osteomyelitis would generally be more diffuse. So for example, if a person has osteomyelitis of the first metatarsal head region, let's just say the person has an ulcer sub-first metatarsal head, you're going to see predominantly the osteomyelitis will be in the distal shaft of the first metatarsal head. Whereas if somebody has a four-foot shark comb, you're going to really see the bone marrow edema be really localized to just the head of the first metatarsal and not necessarily extend all the way to the distal shaft. So that's one of the big differences. The bone marrow edema in Charcot is really limited to the joint space, subchondral area, whereas in osteomyelitis is generally more diffuse and involves more of the bone. In terms of distribution, so for osteomyelitis, the distribution will really be predominantly on one side of the joint. So let's go back to the first metatarsophalangeal joint. Let's just say you have osteo at the base of the proximal phalanx, and then it starts to spread into the metatarsal head. What you'll see is that the majority of the proximal phalanx will be lit up, and then only a portion of the metatarsal head will start to light up on MRI. And what that means is, on osteo, you see more predominance of bone marrow edema on one side of the joint versus the other side of the joint. So again, you will see the entire proximal phalanx or most of it light up, whereas the metatarsal head, you only see a small portion of it light up or show abnormal single, s signal. The difference is now in Charcot, you can see symmetrical subchondral edema. So you'll see the same level of edema between the base of the proximal phalanx and the head of the metatarsal. The other difference in terms of distribution is the number of joints involved. So if you think about osteomyelitis, let's just say you have it at the base of the fourth metatarsal slash cuboid. You're going to see that predominantly it's going to be localized to just that region. Whereas if you have a sharp coat process, you can actually see diffuse across the entire midfoot, especially in the advanced stages. Osteomyelitis in the advanced stages will not necessarily spread across four or five bones, whereas Charcot usually will. So if you have a four foot Charcot, you'll see the basis of the second, third, fourth, and fifth proximal phalanges, as well as the head of the second, third, and fourth, fifth metatarsals all show subchondral bone marrow edema. Whereas if you just had osteomyelitis, sub second metatarsal head, it's not necessary that it's going to spread to all the other metatarsal heads. It will predominantly stay in that one location. And that's what I mean by distribution. So osteo tends to be more localized, whereas Charcot is more diffuse in terms of how many bones it affects. The other important thing is the joints. 
What exactly do joints look like in an osteo versus a Charcot foot? Remember, we said the osteo is predominantly an erosive process, whereas Charcot is a bone destruction or joint destructive process. So when you think about joint disease, you think about subchondral cysts and intraarticular loose bodies, or sometimes called joint mice. Those are very common findings you're going to see in a Charcot type of foot. So again, you'll see subchondral cysts and intraarticular loose bodies, and that's very common in Charcot. With osteomyelitis, generally you would not see that because it's such an erosive process that it will actually eat away at any joint mice and it will eat away at any subchondral cysts. So you generally will not see that. I added location only for the purposes that this might come up on your board exams. Or they might ask you about it on your interviews. But clinically, most physicians do not give location too much credence. So I'll explain why. Location meaning, generally, they're going to say that Charcot affects the midfoot and osteomyelitis affects weight-bearing surfaces, usually the sub-first and fifth metatarsal heads and the calcaneus in the foot. This is very common, you're going to see this if you go through literature and textbooks. We're going to talk about the location, Charcot predominantly in the midfoot and then osteomyelitis predominantly on weight-bearing surfaces the basic, the submetatarsal heads and the calcaneus. But in reality, you can get osteomyelitis of any bone and it can affect any joint. Similarly, Charcot in theory can really affect any joint in the body, especially in the foot. So I wouldn't look at location and assume that you can rule out osteomyelitis or rule in Charcot based off which joint it's affecting. And again, all of these should be taken in combination. I wouldn't say that just because you see more one side of the joint versus meaning bone or edema or one side of the joint versus another, you can automatically rule out one pathology versus the other. You should look at all of these together. So that's internal osseous changes. Now let's talk about soft tissue. Again, osteomyelitis is really an infectious process and many, many, many times you're going to see that it's due to contiguous spread from an ulcer that forms a sinus tract and then it goes through the bone. So if you look at some of the radiology literature, one of the easiest ways to tell if you have an osteo versus a Charcot is to know if there is a cutaneous defect, meaning an ulcer, and then you see a sinus tract that goes directly into a bone and that bone is showing bone marrow signals then you can assume that bone is actually osteomyelitic. Whereas in Charcot, more often than not, you don't have cutaneous defects, you don't have sinus tracts, and you don't have abscesses. Abscesses, sinus tracts, ulcers are usually very indicative of an osteomyelitis process. Another really important thing is tenosynovitis. Again, you will see tenosynovitis in terms of soft tissue in osteomyelitis, not necessarily in Charcot foot. And this is actually the reason why if you do a transmetatarsal amputation, especially for an infectious reason, such as gas gangrene, abscess, or any of those, what you'll see is they'll grab a stat, take the flexor and extensor tendons, clamp them, pull them forward, and take a 15 or 11 blade and cut them as far back as proximal as possible. And the reason is because infection generally spreads once it gets on a tendon, then it can go through the fascial planes and go more proximal. So tenosynovitis is a big sign of osteomyelitis. And that's also just a clinical correlation of understanding surgically why we cut the tendons in an infectious process. The next thing I want to talk about is gadolinium. A lot of the literature says it's really not necessary to order contrast when you get an MRI to differentiate between Charco and OM. The only thing contrast will really help you with is soft tissue. It can help you better visualize it. Um, it can help you better visualize abscesses and sinus tracts. But realistically, most times these patients are already diabetic, they already have renal disease. We don't really bother ordering gadolinium. And it's really not necessary. It doesn't add any diagnostic value. Now let's, I'm going to combine all this and talk about clinically what do you actually see. 
Because when you get an MRI report from a radiologist, the last sentence will always say, please correlate findings clinically, or correlate clinically. Now, in terms of osteomyelitis, so you look at your MRI and your x-ray. If you were a bone skin, you look at that as well. But clinically, how do you help yourself determine do I have a charcoal process or an osteomyelitis? Well, one of the things you can do is order a lab test called the ESR. ESR itself has its limitations, but a lot of the literature will say if you have an ESR above 70, that's really indicative of, of osteomyelitis, assuming there's no other cause of the elevated ESR. So if you just have ESR in the absence of any other cause of an elevated ESR, and it's above 70, that's really indicative of osteomyelitis. Another one, of course, is ulcer, which we talked about in soft tissue. If you already have an ulcer, it can spread contiguously to the bone via a sinus tract, and that can cause osteomyelitis. Even open fractures, we treat open fractures that say they're osteomyelitis, so we still have patients on IV antibiotics. But open fractures can cause, or compound fractures can cause osteomyelitis. Also clinically, if you have probe to bone, and the reason is because if you can take a probe and push it to the bone, it's safe to assume the bacteria from the skin can also spread directly to the bone. So clinically, probe to bone is also really important in helping you understand if you have an infectious process. In terms of charcoal, I put vascular here because oftentimes these patients will have normal or increased blood flow or hyperemia in the lower extremities. That's really common in charcoal. Almost all charcoal parish patients have neuropathy, and that could be due to any cause. Historically, when charcoal was first described in the 1800s, it was actually due to tertiary syphilis. Today, diabetes is the most common cause, but historically it was syphilis. HIV uncontrolled can also cause neuropathy, a gunshot wound to, a gunshot wound to lower back, where you start to lose sensation and proprioception can also cause neuropathy, and a person can develop a charcoal foot. So charcoal is really due to anything that's, that can cause neuropathy. So a lot of times patients will have normal vascular supply, but then a dense peripheral neuropathy. And then also, many, many times, patients with charcoal, before they get charcoal, they'll have an onset of some type of trauma. Many times in midfoot, diabetic patients that have this frank injury, it's not uncommon for them to later on develop a charcoal foot in that region. Also clinically what you'll see is that the affected foot and charcoal will be about 2 Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius warmer than the contralateral foot. Also the foot will be erythematous, swollen, indurated. These are all common signs of a charcoal foot. Now it's not also not uncommon if the two can coexist, meaning a patient can have a charcoal foot and then also have osteomyelitis. Again, the easiest way to do that is if a person has an ulceration, that's almost a giveaway this person can develop osteomyelitis in the same region where there was already a sharp coat deformity. If you take a repeat MRI, sometimes a month or two or three months later, remember how we said that osteomyelitis is an erosive process? What you'll see is if you compare the two MRIs and the person just had a sharp coat foot, you'll see the subchondral cyst and you'll see the intraarticular loose bodies. But a couple months later, if you take a repeat MRI and the person has osteo in that specific region, sometimes you're going to see that the intraarticular loose bodies and the subchondral cysts have been eroded away and they're no longer visible on MRI. So I hope this video, I hope this lecture was helpful in helping you guys determine the differences between Charcot and osteomyelitis on an MRI. Thank you for watching.